اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم Evaluating Structure Model Step 4 The Step 4 in the series of Structure Model Assessment is Predictive Power. Assess the model's predictive power. Now many researchers interpret the R-square statistic as a measure of their model's predictive power. Now this interpretation is not entirely correct. However, since the R-square only indicates the model's in-sample explanatory power. That is, you can explain your endogenous variables for the whole sample. In-sample refers to the data that you have and out-of-sample to the data that you do not have but want to forecast or estimate. It says nothing about the predictive power, how well you can predict the outcome. Now, in order to do so, what you need is you need out-of-sample predictive power. The out-of-sample predictive power indicates a model's ability to predict a new or future observation. Now, addressing this concern, PLS predict was introduced as a procedure for out-of-sample prediction. Execution of PLS predict involves estimating the model on a training sample and evaluating its predictive performance on the holdout sample. In simple terms, what happens in PLS predict analysis is that your overall sample is divided into two subsamples. One is training sample and the other is holdout sample. And the predictive performance is evaluated on the holdout sample based on the training sample. We are going to further look into as to what is meant by training and holdout sample. Note that the holdout sample is separated from the total sample before executing the initial analysis. And this helps us in out of sample predictive power. So it includes data that were not used in the model estimation. So this holdout sample is not used in the estimation. The estimation is based on your training sample. And that training sample is later used to predict the outcome in the holdout sample. Researcher need to make sure that the training sample has adequate sample size. For example, look into inverse square root method that has already been discussed in the book on seminar plus in the earlier videos as well. Execution of PLS predict involves estimating the model on training sample and evaluating its predictive performance on the holdout sample. So you predict your outcome in the holdout sample based on the training sample. Note that the holdout sample is separated from the total sample before executing the initial analysis on the training sample. Now how is it? Now how is your holdout sample separated? Now it is through random process. PLS predict executes k fold cross validation. Now what is this fold? A fold is a subgroup of total sample. Let's say I've got a sample size of 100. Now, this is fold 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This fold here, fold 1, will have 5 subgroups. Let's say I'm doing 5 fold validation. So, in fold 1, I will divide one subgroup as holdout sample, whereas all the other subgroups will be my training sample. Let's say I've got a sample size of 100. So my holdout sample will have 20 responses and my training sample or my training samples rather will have 80 responses. So these 80 will be used to predict this holdout one. And again in the second fold, the, the training sample from the fold one becomes the holdout sample. In fold three, the third training sample becomes the holdout sample. In fold four, the fourth training sample becomes the holdout sample, so on and so forth. The number of folds, the number of holdout samples, the number of analysis or cross-validations. For example, a cross-validation based on five folds splits the sample into five equally sized data subsets. Now, this is fold one, and you've got a sample size of, let's say, 100. So your holdout one is 20 respondents. 20, 20, 20, 20. So 80 respondents in these four training subsets. 
Similarly, in fold 2, your training sample or training subset from fold 1 becomes your holdout sample. So each of the training sample will become a holdout sample in each fold. And in each fold, these training samples are combined to predict this holdout sample. Holdout sample is predicted based on your training sample. Each case in every holdout sample has a predicted value estimated with the respective training sample. Now, a training sample is a portion of overall data set used to estimate model parameters, that is, path coefficients, indicator weights, and loadings. The remaining part of the data set that is not used for estimation is your holdout sample. The training data set is used to estimate, that is, train the weights and paths of our model, and these are used to predict the outcomes in the holdout sample. We then evaluate the prediction matrices that is RMSE or MAE of the predictions on the holdout sample. We do not compare predictions of training and holdout sample. So what does this mean? What are these prediction errors? We are going to look into this. Now where is our figure? Here is our figure. And this is already explained. We've got five folds, each fold in five subgroups. For each validation, each subset is used as a holdout sample. Now, obviously, we've discussed this. Each subset becomes a holdout sample, the rest of them combined as training sample. And again, for each fold, your each training sample becomes your holdout sample. And the process is repeated for each of the folds. Now, why do we need so many folds and so many subsample? That is to avoid abnormal solutions. Now, this is the reason we should run PLS predict multiple times. Now, to assess a model's predictive power, researchers can draw on several prediction statistics that quantify the amount of prediction error. In the indicators of a particular endogenous construct. Now, what is this error? Error is not an error as in a mistake. It is a residual. The lower the better, this is the difference between the actual values and the predictive value. So the lesser the residual, the lesser the, the, lesser the difference between the actual and predicted values, the higher is the predictive power. The most popular metric is RMSE root mean square error. Otherwise, we can use mean absolute error. But this depends on the skewness of the residual error. The use of this is dependent on the skewness of your residual. In most instances, researchers would use RMSE to examine models predictive power. But if the prediction error distribution is highly non-symmetric as evidenced in a long left or right tail in the distribution of predicted prediction errors. So if your prediction errors have skewness, then you are going to use MAE. Otherwise, you are going to use RMSE. Now, how do we interpret these matrices? A researcher needs to compare each indicator's RMSE, that is the indicator of the endogenous construct or MAE with the naive linear regression model that is LM benchmark. The LM benchmark values are obtained by running linear regression of each of the dependent constructs indicators on the indicators of exogenous construct in the PLS path model. So in order to do this, what you need to do is you are simply making comparisons between each indicators RMSE or MAE with the linear regression model benchmark. Now, in comparing the RMSE or MAE values with the LM values, following guidelines apply. Now, how do you make sure that your model has predictive power? So, your prediction error must be low. So, PLS SCM analysis has lower RMSE or MAE in comparison to LM benchmark. Now, if all the indicators in the PLS SCM analysis have lower RMSE or MAE, then Obviously, if they have got lower RMSC or MAE values compared to the naive LM benchmark, the model has high predictive power. If the majority of the indicators have 
low RMSE or MAE in comparison to LM benchmark, then it is medium predictive power. If minority of the dependent construct indicators produce lower PLS SEM prediction errors compared to LM benchmark, then this indicates low predictive power. And finally, if PLS SCM analysis compared to LM yields lower prediction errors in terms of the RMSE or MAE, none of the indicators this indicates model lack of predictive power. That is, all the indicators from PLS SCM analysis have a higher value of RMSE or MAE in comparison to LM benchmark, then this indicates there is no prediction power at all. An important decision when using PLS predict is to how to generate predictions when the PLS path model includes a mediator construct. Now again, our models are not that simple. In most cases, our models will have mediators as well. Now a mediator is both an outcome and a predictor itself. So SM in R offers two alternatives to generate predictions in such a model setup. Researchers can choose to generate predictions using either the direct antecedents or the earliest antecedents approach. In the D approach, PLS predict would consider both the antecedent and the mediator as predictors of the outcome constructs. Whereas in the E approach, the mediator would be excluded from the analysis. Deng presents simulation evidence that DA approach generates predictions with highest accuracy, hence we are going to use the DA approach. So now how do we use the PLS predict function or predict underscore PLS function in R? To do so, let's copy this text and understand it as well. Now this is the code that I have written here. And this is the object that is going to use or hold the predicted model. This is the P PLS predict function or predict underscore PLS function. The argument is your model, the estimated PLS model, your technique, your number of folds, your number of repetitions. And then we are going to get the summary in our summary underscore predict. So how do we do this? Let's first run it. Copy. And I've already pasted here. So PLS predict underscore model, predict underscore PLS function, simple underscore model is the estimated PLS model that we have and that we've been using for all our sessions previously. Your technique is predict underscore DA, number of folds default, depths 10. These are by default. Now let's run this whole text because obviously this is new estimation. So now since it runs, let's go back here and let's see what is this. Now, there was one thing that we earlier said that, okay, which mechanism are we going to use? Are we going to use RMSE or we are going to use MAE? Now, the distribution of prediction error needs to be assessed. Now, which prediction error mechanism or matrix or matrices to be used? Now, if the prediction error is highly skewed, the MAE is more appropriate metric than RMSE. Now, in order to assess the distribution of prediction error, whether it is skewed or not, we are going to use the plot function with the indicators for our endogenous variable. So, how do we do this? Let's copy this. Let's get back here. Now, we are, our PLS predict function is calculated. And where is it? I've already got it here. Let's run it. And here are your graphs. So how do we interpret this? Have a look. Let's run it. Let's look at this. The results in figure show that while all plots have a tail and they are slightly skewed. Look at this. There is a tail, tail, there's a tail here, there's a tail here, tail here, tail here. These two are negatively skewed. This is positive skewness. So the tail on the left, there's a tail on the right. However, it does not look that it is too high or there is too much of skewness. Hence, we are going to use RMSE for assessment of prediction errors. Now let's run it. Have a look. And let's say we already stored the results in our summary object here. Now let's call the summary object. 
summary underscore dict and let's call it. Now look at this. PLS in sample matrix, PLS out of sample matrix. Now we are not concerned about in sample matrix. We are concerned about out of sample matrix here. And we are going to compare it to LM out of sample matrix. Now let's have a look here. I've already highlighted it. So we have called the summary underscore predict object to get this particular out. Now look at this out of sample matrix. CC1. Is CC1 here? 1.268. We are going to use RMSE because there was not too much of skewness. 1.268 is less than 1.270. Now CC2, 1.368. This is less than 1.372. The same is the case with CC3, CC4, CC5, CC6. So this shows that the model has high predictive power. We find that PLS model has lower out of sample predictive error compared to naive LM model benchmark for all the indicators. So, this shows that the model has very high predictive power. Why? Because if we go to the guidelines, let's have a look at the guidelines. If all the indicators in the PLS SCM analysis have lower RMSE, in this case it was RMSE, in comparison to naive LM benchmark, the model has high predictive power. So in this case, our model has a high predictive power. Now this is how you are going to use PLS predict in SEM in R. Thank you very much.